Hey everybody, welcome back to I Play 2 Podcast, where relatives of famous athletes, entertainers, and musicians get to tell their stories. I'm your host, Rob Adler. On the show this week is 1989 Ivy League Football Player of the Year, Judd Garrett. Judd would go on to be drafted by the Eagles and would also play in the World League and the Canadian Football League. Judd's brother Jason played for and later was the head coach of both the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants. Judd, welcome to the show. How you doing? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you for being on the show. The first question that I have is, how did you get involved with football? Well, my dad was was a longtime football guy. I mean, he coached in the NFL for 14 years. He coached in college for another you know six or eight years. He was a longtime scout with the Cowboys and the Bills. So, I mean, he had a good 45, 50 years in professional football. So, just growing up, we we're always around it. My dad coached at the Giants back in the early 70s, and we'd go to the practices, we'd go to the training camps, we'd be in the locker room. Same thing when it was with the Browns. So it was always something that was there and in front of us, and it's a great game. So if you have that type of access, you just sort of gravitate to it, and you, and you start playing and working at it and competing. From early on being in locker rooms, could you kind of get a sense of what it took to be an NFL player? I remember a number of times my dad would bring me in or bring me and my brothers into the locker room after a game, and you'd see these guys, and they're all beat up and bloody, and they're totally exhausted. And you get a sense of how hard and physical and, and demanding the game is. And there was a number of times that we went to the Browns facility during the off season and lifted weights there. And this is when we were, you know, maybe eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. And you're around the, these NFL guys who are lifting weights and getting ready for the season. And, and you see the type of work ethic they have and the way they lift the weights and the seriousness they have to it. We realized that it was more than just the game that you go play in the park on Sunday. It was, it, it was a serious profession. Like the locker rooms that you saw, you grew up with two brothers, Jason, who we mentioned, and John as well, who played in the NFL with Cincinnati and later became a coach also. Was there a family competition of wanting to be better? How did that all work with three boys all wanting to play the same game? Well, there was a lot of competition when we're actually competing against each other. We had some legendary pick up basketball games where we would almost go to blows because we're so competitive, fouling and knocking people over and, and, and that type of competitiveness. I think when it came to playing the organized sports, I don't think there was a lot of competition that way. If, if Jason or John hit a home run in baseball, I, I was happy for them. I wasn't resentful or jealous or, or competitive towards them. But we, we go head to head a little bit. The competition rears its ugly head. But I think we always sort of rooted for each other and ho hope each other did the best they could when we were playing in the organized team sports. Speaking of the organized team sports, you mentioned basketball and baseball. What's the importance of playing multiple sports growing up for any athlete? In my day, Everyone did it. It, it, was, it was what you did. And, and, and I feel like it makes you a better competitor and it makes you a more well-rounded athlete. So I, I think it was important for us to do it. I feel like playing basketball helped me when I went out on the football field. The level of movement and change of direction that you need to have to play basketball and the speed and the quickness that carries over directly to the football field. And then there's also, you know, some strength and toughness that you take from the football field that you can carry over onto the basketball court. Baseball is one of the high concentration, mentally tough, highly skilled sports. So being involved in something like that can always benefit you in the other sport. Nowadays, a lot of kids are specializing at an early age, and I think it helps them to a certain degree to do that. They also miss out on some other benefits from playing multiple sports. 
I know you ended up playing football, but out of the three, which sport did you enjoy the most? If you were going to ask, it was probably basketball. Basketball is probably the funnest game. It's not as much work and drudgery as, as football is. Where, where basketball, you can just kind of run and play. And so that was probably f the funnest. But I enjoyed them all for all different types of reasons. You mentioned the drudgery of football. I hear the word drudgery, and I'm like, that doesn't sound like fun. Could you kind of elaborate on what you mean by the drudgery of football? When we play baseball in the spring or summer, some of the guys that were full-time baseball players would say to us, I don't know how you guys do it. You practice for six days to play one game, whereas in baseball, we were playing three, four, four games a week. So th there's a lot of practice. There's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of work just to get to the game, and you only have a limited number of games to play. So once the game starts, it's fun. You enjoy it. You love the competition. You love being out on the field. But, you know, you got six days of preparation you got to put in to, to get to that one day. So that, that's a little bit what I meant by drudgery. You, your brother Jason, and your brother John all ended up playing skill positions, but different skill positions. How did you gravitate to becoming a running back? When I first started playing in the mid-70s and into the 80s, if you think back at the NFL and college football, the running back was almost the most important position on the team. I kind of felt like I wanted that type of position. Now, the running back's a little bit been pushed to the wayside or de-emphasized in this day and age. But if you remember back in the 70s and 80s, the running back was the position to play. So when I started playing in fourth grade and fifth grade, I just tried out for that position and I was able to, to win the starting job and I just kept doing it. Jason, he always wanted to be the quarterback. He always wanted to be sort of the leader and and all of that. So I think that's why he gravitated towards that. And John was a little bit smaller and faster. So the receiver position sort of fit him a little bit better. With wanting to be a running back, and you talked about the running backs of the 70s, you know, whether it be OJ or Walter Payton or someone like that, who were your football running back idols that you were like, you know, maybe I could be like that guy? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was a big fan of OJ at the time. I was I was a real big fan of Walter Payton, but the guy that that I sort of liked the most and and tried to emulate, and I never really saw him play live. I used to see highlight films of him. Was Gale Sayers? I, I just thought he was able to do these extraordinary things on the football field that these other guys weren't doing. Jim Brown was real big and strong, and he could break tackles and he had speed. OJ was real fast, so he could just outrun everybody. Walter Payton was so tough, he could break tackles. You watch Gale Sayers, and he was making cuts and moves and, and doing things and vision that, like, no one else was doing. It was sort of an extraordinary thing to watch. He was sort of Barry Sanders before Barry Sanders and probably a bigger version. So I, I always liked him because he was doing things that, that, that very few people could do. When you talk about Sayers' vision, and for anyone listening who's not familiar with him, uh, Sayers played for the Bears and was an excellent running back and also a really good kick returner, particularly in college. When you talk about his vision, could you kind of elaborate a little bit more of what you mean by that? As a running back, you have to be able to see beyond just your immediate hole of entry where the, where the play is designed. And you have to be able to see what the backside's doing. You have to be able to see what the second level where the linebackers and the safeties are doing. You got to be able to see sort of the whole field while also being able to know exactly where you're going. He would make some runs where he's starting off to the right, maybe going off tackle or around the end to the right. And he sees something on the backside, a hole open up, a lane open up, and he's able to put his foot in the ground and, and burst that way. Emmett had that type of vision. He could see, you know, almost the whole field and see where everybody was and make all those right cuts to get back to where the opening was. I mean, a lot of guys, they're great running backs in the league that you give them the ball 
and you go over the right tackle, they're going to hit it 100 miles an hour, and they're big and strong, and they're explosive, and they'll they'll blast through that hole, and you know make a maybe make a guy miss on the second level, but they're not seeing the whole field the way a few guys like Sayers and Emmett used to. How were you able to incorporate what you saw from Sayers' game into some of your game? as you started getting older and getting into high school and developing your running style? My style was similar to his. I worked on my vision. My dad being a coach and a scout in the, in the NFL, we, we did a lot of workouts in, in the backyard over the summers when we were in New Jersey. And he would set up drills where just basically what I'm talking about, he would set up these cones and they'd be spread out from all the way from the D-gap to the strong side to the D-gap, to the weak side, start off to the right, and he would give signals. And a lot of times he would have some of the other guys stand in those places. And the one guy that moved out of the way, I'd have to see and come back to where that hole opened up. So it forced me to not look strictly at where I'm going, but also be able to see peripherally what's going on around me. Was there any one of those drills that you'd say, ah, oh, not this again? No, not really. I mean, the one thing that, that I think, you know, for me, and I think with a lot of players, I think most players are willing to do whatever work is asked of them if they understand that the work they're asked to do is going to make them better and benefit them and help them win. So most of the stuff that we did with my dad, they were all real good drills that I knew were, was making me better. So I'm not saying that I wasn't tired and worn out and all that, but I never said not this drill again because I knew by doing the drill, I was going to get better and better and better. And that's the thing. I mean, a lot of times you come across coaches and sort of doing a drill just to do a drill and you don't really know what it's doing to make you better. And that's when players sort of become lazy and, and non-focused and all that. It's important that, you know, what you're asking the players to do, th they believe in and they understand it's making them better. As you're getting better and getting into high school, when was the first thought you had that said, you know what, maybe I could do this at the college level? I was hoping that I'd be able to get to do it at the college level when I went to high school. I think that's that's sort of the process. So your thought process then is, okay, I'm playing now. Hopefully I'm successful. We're trying to win the city championship. But I'm hoping to play in high school. And then you get to high school, and then you start having success. And you're like, I'm hoping to play in college. And then once you get to college, now your eyes turn to, and maybe beyond this, I can play in the pros. So I was always hoping from day one in high school. Early on in my junior year, I had a couple big games. Then you start getting some some mail and calls from colleges, and you start thinking that maybe I can take to the next step. What's a game, a carry, a moment that sticks out when you do get to think about it, brings back a smile and a good memory? The first one I would say is I was fortunate enough to be able to earn my way into the starting lineup my sophomore year for the last five games. For those five games, I was in the huddle with Jason and John. So John was a starting receiver. Jason was the quarterback. And I was playing sort of a flanker back position. We, we were able to play together. That was always a good experience for me. I, I think back on that. There were some great games. Cleveland Central Catholic, they were a better school than us. We went up there and it was my senior year. And it was, it was October night. It was a little chilly. They gave me the ball a lot. I think I got it 35, 40 times. And we just grinded it out, and we were able to beat them by a touchdown. And, and they were a good football team, and that was a good memory. You know, I, I just like the whole experience, and I like being able to play with my brothers. You talked a little bit about playing with both of your brothers. Kind of expand on that, of what it was like to have three members of the same family on the same side of the ball. At the time, John was a starter going into his senior year. Jason, he was in a little bit of a competition, but he won the starting job. And they had a, an established starting halfback. So I, I wasn't able to win the starting job out of training camp, but being named the starter halfway through the season, you know, just getting in the huddle with a bunch of seniors was a little bit of a step for me. But then also being in there with my two brothers and 
my role wasn't that big on the team. Uh, it wasn't like they're giving me the ball a lot. I was out there, and I remember the one time I motioned out and I ran a dig route, a 16 yard in, and Jason just threw it to me right out of the break, and I made the catch, and it was a pretty big play. But it was something that we had done probably a hundred times in the backyard over the summer the past couple of years. It felt kind of natural, even though, you know, it was a different venue at the time. Were you guys able to separate being teammates from being family members? Because sometimes that can bleed over. I think for the most part, we treated each other like players. You know, I mean, when Jason was in that competition for the starting job, Obviously, I, I wanted him to win the starting job, but I also thought and knew that he was better than the other guy. So it wasn't so much, oh, he's my brother. I'm blind to the fact that he's not as good. No, he was better. And there was never a point when I was going with his competition, you know, in the same huddle that I was like going to purposely miss my block so he gets sacked or run the wrong route so he doesn't look good. I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm trying to show the coaches that I can play. So. There was never anything like that. I think for the most part, we, we saw each other as, as teammates. What was the recruiting process like for you? I had a couple of big games early in my junior year. So I started being recruited a lot by the Ivy League schools. And then going into my senior year, I got into Street and Smith, a magazine where they would list all the, the upcoming seniors in the high school. And, and my name was listed. And schools like Michigan and Notre Dame, they made calls. I really thought Notre Dame was, was going to end up offering me, but they, they went in another direction. So, yeah, I mean, so, some of the bigger schools talked to me, but I never got I never got an offer from any of them. And got I got recruited pretty heavily by Princeton, Dartmouth, Yale, Brown, Columbia, it was mainly just the Ivy Leagues were, were recruiting me towards the end. When you finally picked a school, what influenced your decision to go there? Well, I don't know if you know the story. I ended up applying early to Princeton, and I got in right around Thanksgiving, and I was still sort of considering Yale at the time. You know, my dad ended up getting the head job at Columbia. John was already at Columbia, and Jason was at Princeton, so... When my dad got the job at Columbia, I decided to go to Columbia, and then Jason transferred over, and we're all going to sort of play together and coach by my dad. His his tenure at, at Columbia lasted about a year. Jason was able to transfer back over to Princeton, and then I was able to, to, to get in, and then John transferred over. That's the way the whole thing worked out. My dad had never gotten the Columbia job. It probably would have come down between Princeton and Yale. You had to set out your first year, correct? I played my freshman year at, at Columbia on the freshman team. They had a freshman rule back then. You couldn't play varsity as a freshman. And then when I when I transferred back to Princeton, I had to sit out a year. I, I could start playing again in 87. And that was that was sort of my, my sophomore year. You finally can get to play again. How much were you itching to play again after not being able to play it was hard to sit out the year I sat out. John and Jason had to sit out as well. And the team wasn't very good. I think they ended up 2-8 and eight that year. It was hard because I knew all three of us could help this team. We could help make them better. And that, that was the hardest part. You know, once we got through that season, then it was all, all eyes towards the next year. Before we get back to your career, what was it like to balance an Ivy League academic workload with also playing football? Well, you had to be disciplined. If you're disciplined with your time, it's very doable. I think the guys that get into trouble are the ones that aren't disciplined, the ones that, that end up wasting time. I, I made a point to go to every class. There were guys that would miss class and they end up getting in trouble because they'd end up getting behind. First of all, you, you, you can sort of set up your schedule where it's real efficient. Make sure you go to all your classes, and then and at night after practice, you got to get back to your room or get to the library, and you got to do your work. If you just stay on top of everything and and are disciplined and don't waste time, it's a very doable thing. Some of the bigger schools, they will somewhat cater to athletes in terms of allowing them to miss a class or take an exam at a different point. 
Was that allowed at all with anything being able to be changed for you? Or was it basically, this is what it is, and you have to do it yourself? It, it depends on, on who the professor was. There were going to be some conflicts. You got to communicate the conflicts well in advance to your professor, to your preceptor and all that. And some of them handled them differently. I, I went to play in the hula bowl my senior year. The hula bowl was like January 7th or whatever that I was going to play in my senior year. I had a paper due like the Friday before the hula bowl was going to be played. So I went and asked the professor, could I turn the paper in late after I got back from the hula bowl? And he said, no, I had to turn it in before I left. So I had to do the work ahead of time. Some professors were like that. Other professors would have allowed me to turn it in a couple of days late. But th there wasn't a blanket accommodation for sports. You had to handle it yourself. You couldn't just ask somebody in the football office to make a call and they get it fixed for you. You got to handle it yourself. Going back to on the field, you were 1989 Ivy League Player of the Year. What from that year sticks out for you? The year before, we, we should have beaten Holy Cross. We kicked a field goal right towards the end of the game to go ahead. There was like two seconds on the clock, and they returned a kickoff for a touchdown. They lateral the ball like six or seven times. It's sort of like with, with the Cal-Stanford game. We go up there to play them early in the year, thinking that, that, that we're, we're going to be able to beat us by several touchdowns, and it was really sort of a demoralizing game. But I remember from that game, we sort of came together as a team, and we went on a really good winning streak throughout the Ivy League. Uh, we ended up sharing the title with Yale that year. I, I think of that game, it was a hard defeat that it sort of brought the team together. But I think the game that, that I remember the most from that season is the Harvard game. We had a halfback pass called on the first play, so I ended up throwing a 70-yard touchdown pass to my good friend Scott Gibbs. It was a big game for us. It was a big win. I played well. I think it was sort of the game that we're on a little bit of a streak. Beating Harvard sort of told us that we were going to be a team to beat that year in the Ivy League. So that year... You guys were tied with Yale at 5-0. and oh. Walk me through that game and sort of what happened the rest of the season. That was the second to last game of the year. I think it was the biggest attendance that I played in front of at Princeton. Fans were filled, and they were a good team, and we were a good team. And we ended up losing it 14-7. to seven. Uh, We had a couple chances at the end to tie it up, and we just didn't, we didn't get it done. So we go into those games, we're both 5-0, and oh, so it looks like they're going to be Ivy League title. They had Harvard the next week. We had Cornell. We were so disappointing. That week of practice wasn't a very good week of practice for us, to be honest with you. Everybody was sort of down from that loss. Guys weren't real focused. We were just assuming that, that, that we had lost all hope. So we start the game out with Cornell. We're, we're sort of stumbling around. Right around halftime, we got the report that Harvard was beating Yale 28 to 7. It sort of lit, lit a fire under us, and we came out and we shut them down and we scored a couple touchdowns. We ended up winning by, I think, 21 to 7. Harvard finished the game and beat, beat Yale. So in the Ivy League, if you end up having the same record, they share the title. Well, that's got to be pretty cool, even though maybe not the way you wanted to get an Ivy League title. You still get to have one. We were 6-1. and one. We were a good team, and being called Ivy League champs that year was, was a good representation of, of, of who we are, who we were as a team. How long had it been since Princeton had won an Ivy League title? It, it went all the way back to 69, so it was 20 years. And that was one of my goals when I got to Princeton. And in the locker rooms, they had all the, the pictures of the past you know, Ivy League champions. One thing I noticed was all the pictures were in black and white, and they were in black and white because they hadn't they hadn't had a champion since the '60s. We had, we had a really good team that year, a lot of good players. Bob Serace, who's now the head coach at Princeton, he was our starting center, three-time All Ivy player. Your senior year, you win Ivy League Player of the Year. You have a co-share of the Ivy League title. The NFL draft is just around the corner, and traditionally. Most Ivy League players aren't looked at as 
NFL draft prospects. Did you ever think you were going to be drafted? I got to go to the Hula Bowl. I got to go to the Combine. I was around those guys, a lot of the guys that were, that were being viewed as draftable guys. And some of them were, were unbelievable athletes. But some of them, I was like, I'm in the mix with a lot of these guys. I didn't think everybody was like head and shoulders better than me. I thought there were there were a number of players that I was a good, as good as, if not better, in those two different exposures to the, the higher level of player. So I felt like I had a chance. I don't want to like get my hopes up, so I kind of resigned myself that I'd probably do what my two brothers did. You don't get drafted, they end up signing the night of the draft as as a college free agent. So I sort of was anticipating that, but they got into the, the last round, the Eagles ended up drafting me. The Eagles draft you in the 12th round, and at that time, the Eagles had Buddy Ryan as the head coach. What was your first meeting with Buddy like, and what were your initial impressions of him? I never really formally met Buddy. You know, you're on the team. I think if I was the first-round pick, a player trying out at that point. He was a hard coach. He was a demanding coach. He demanded toughness. Thought it was a good exposure to me to the NFL and and next to Jimmy Johnson's camps uh, at Dallas. I think Buddy ran probably the hardest camp, the most physical camp. And I was with other teams. I was in camp with Buffalo and Seattle and, and, and Carolina. Philadelphia camp and the, and the Cowboys camps were the two hardest, most physically demanded and physical camps that I was involved in. So it was a good initiation into the NFL. I felt like to survive that camp, then I could survive what the best of the NFL could throw at me. It, it was a good experience for me. What was a practice like? Because back then, practices, from what I remember, were a little more demanding than what the CBA would allow now. Well, I'll tell you, as a young guy... And trying to make the team, you know, you have to be involved in special teams. So before every practice, we had a half hour special team session. The, the veterans like the Randall Cunningham and Keith Byers and Keith Jackson, those guys weren't out on the field. It was, this was all young guys. So we were out there for a half hour doing two phases of special teams and going at it. This wasn't a walkthrough. I mean, it, was, it wasn't full physical stuff, but we were running and and all of that. So then that ends. And then then we have stretching and then immediately after stretching, we either did this as a team or we did this as position groups. We did up down, and sometimes we do twenty five up downs. Sometimes we do thirty up downs. There were a few times we even did fifty up downs. Those are pretty hard. They take a lot out of you. That was the first thing after stretch. We did inside run, but it was different from from a lot of the other inside runs I've been around. And that this was it was basically nine on nine just take the receivers and the corners out of the game. And it was just full go, live, almost like a goal line drill. And we did that every day, every practice for the entire camp. It was real physical. It was real tough morning and afternoon. And it was two practices a day, one day off a week. But if we didn't have a day off, we were doing two days. So we'd go six, two days in a row, and then we'd have a day off and then six, two days in a row, and then we kept doing that until we started playing games. It was a tough, physical, demanding practice. That sounds excruciatingly not only difficult from an endurance standpoint, but from a, a physical standpoint. Did you ever have any injuries or have to go see a trainer to handle those? The story that I tell about that camp, my dad, who was a longtime NFL coach, and knowing that I'm a guy that's trying to make the team, he told me, he said, don't go to the trainer because the coaches, the personnel people, they see you in the training room or, or they, they get the reports from the trainer that you're always in the training room, that they're just going to work that against you. They don't want a guy that's in the training room a lot. He said, if you, if you have bumps and bruises, you sprained your ankle, whatever it is, just grab a bag of ice, go up to your to your dorm room and, and ice yourself down yourself. Don't go to the trainers. I took his advice. <laughs> I never went to the trainer. I mean, I got beat up, I, you know, my shoulders, I got bruises. So I would just grab a couple bags of ice after meetings and just go to my room and just ice myself down best I could. And then just try to get ready for practice the next day. We go through camp, we go through the preseason. 
We haven't broken camp yet. I think there's one more game to play. I think we're breaking camp like in a day or two. But they already started cutting some players. I'm in my dorm room after meetings. and I, There's a knock on my door. It's the assistant trainer. And he's like, I want you to come with me. So I immediately assumed that I was being cut because th that's sort of what happens. Somebody comes and gets you and brings you to the head coach or the general manager, and they tell you that they're moving on from you. So I'm immediately like, I'm cut. I'm sort of pissed off. So I'm following the sky, and, and we don't really go to the coach's offices. We go down toward the training room, and he brings me into the training room, and Otho Davis, who was the trainer at the time, he says, I want you to come here. So I come into his office, and he opens up his book, and he has a list of all the players, and he points out my name. He goes, look at this, and he says, you're the only player in camp that's never come and see, seen me all camp. So he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reward you. I'm going to have these trainers give you a full body massage, which, <laughs> which I didn't really want. I mean, I, I was just like, fine. I'm like, really? Like, yeah. So I lay down on the table. They give me the massage. So while they're doing it, Jerome Brown and Randall Cunningham walk in. And they're pissed because <laughs> this rookie last round draft pick is getting full body massage. And they've never given those guys massages. They're giving the trainer a hard time. And that's one of my claims to fame. I went through the entire Philadelphia Eagles training camp, and I never went to see the trainer once. Did you make the team? What happened was we played our last preseason game in Pittsburgh. Then the next day, basically, you come in. So that's the Monday of the, the giant week, the first game of the season. We're all in the in the locker room. And what was happening was you just sit in your locker. These these people would come in and they'd grab a player and say, I want you to come with me. And they'd go and they'd get cut. So I got in, in there early, like 730. And I just sat in my locker for like an hour, hour and a half. And guys were just getting cut. So I'm just waiting to get cut. They cut Chris Carter. I watched them come and cut Chris Carter, the future Hall of Famer. I was standing right there. His locker was right across from mine. And they came up and they grabbed him. So then after a while, it just stopped happening. So I'm kind of like, did I make this team? So then everybody starts go, going to the morning meetings. So I just go to the morning meetings. So we have meetings all, all morning, and then we have a walkthrough at like 1130. So we went to the walkthrough, and I'm out there, and I'm counting the numbers. They only kept 47 back then. And I was counting the numbers, and I was like, there's only 47 here, right? And I counted like three times. I made sure that I counted myself. and I was like, I think I made this team. And then the walkthrough was over. We went and had lunch. And then we we're going to have a quick meeting before practice. And so I go to that meeting and Dave Atkins, the running back coach, before the meeting started, said, I need you to come here. And he brought me into his office and, and he, you know, he let me go. They had made a trade for Roger Vick, who was the former uh, number one pick to the Jets out of, I think, Texas A&M. The Eagles release you. What are you thinking at this point, and where do you kind of go from here? Well, the Eagles released me, and again, my, my parents at that point were in New Jersey, so it was an hour and a half drive home, so I drove home and just trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I got a little bit, I hate to use the word screwed, but I will in this situation. They had the practice squad in 89, and then they sort of discontinued it in 90 because the players were asking for more money. I think the Eagles would have put me on the practice squad when, when they released me. For that first four to six weeks that season, they didn't have a, a practice squad. So I went up to Canada. I was on their practice squad for a week. When I was up there, the Cowboys called and they wanted me to come down because what Jimmy Johnson was doing at the time was he was bringing guys in, putting them on the IR and then the rule back then was they had this short-term injured reserve, like a four-week injured reserve. And then when you came off injured reserve, you could practice for three weeks. So he was trying to create a practice squad by just bringing guys in, putting them on the IR. And then when they come off, they can practice. So I go down to Dallas, I sign, they put me on IR. And then in the middle of, of me being on the injured reserve, the league reinstitutes the practice squad. 
and I was ineligible at that point because I was on in the reserve. So the Cowboys filled out their practice squad. And then I was ineligible for the Eagles practice squad because I was on the Cowboys injured reserve. So when I came off IR, they ended up releasing me. I think if they had a practice squad at the time I was released, I probably would have been put on the the Eagles. You get released again. Where do you go? I know you went to the World League, but was that your next stop? It was second week of October when I came back from Dallas. I ended up coaching at Princeton, their freshman team, for the remainder of the season. Keith Elias, who ended up playing in the NFL, he was a freshman running back. So I ended up being able to coach him. That was a good, fun deal for me. After that season, then I went to the World League in 91, played for the London Monarchs. Playing in the World League at that time, you had a European division and a North American division. What was the travel like, and who did you play with? It was a little hard. We had training camp down in Orlando, then flew out to London. First game was in Germany. In fact, I inadvertently scored the first points in World League history. We had the ball backed up uh, on our own one-yard line. Larry Kenner, our coach, called this play called 22 Scissors Trap, where I lined up as sort of a wing and I came, I folded back inside. It's supposed to be a play that, that that could hit pretty big and our center got beat. The guy was sitting in the hole and ended up getting tackled for a safety. Those are the first points. It was me getting tackled for a safety. And then we played two home games, I think, with Orlando and New York. Then we had a one-game shot to the States in Birmingham. We flew in Thursday, played the game on Saturday, flew right back. Then we played a few more games in London. Then we came back over and did a three-game road trip. Flew to San Antonio, then up to New York, and then out to Sacramento. And then we came all the way back. And then we finished up with, with Barcelona. So we did a lot of traveling. Got married, you don't have kids. That, that type of traveling doesn't really bother you go out to, to Sacramento when you spend a week in California, that, that's sort of a fun deal. It's not like you're away from your wife and kids. So there's a lot of traveling, but it was enjoyable. And we were winning. We won the first nine games. We lost to Barcelona in game 10. And then we won one playoff game against New York. And then we, then we won the World Bowl against Barcelona. So that was a fun year. That World Bowl, you had one heck of a game. They were doubling John Horton, and they are putting an extra guy in the box to take away a running game. And so the inside receivers were, were singled up, and I had a lot of one-on-one opportunities, and I was able to catch a, catch a bunch of balls just because of the way they were playing us. Going back for a second, yes, you mentioned that you had played, I think, in San Antonio. Did you play against your brother in that game? Played against both John and Jason. Uh, can I ask a question? Because I don't have the stats in front of me. Who won? We won. We were a really good team. You know, Larry Cannon, our head coach, he was a longtime NFL coach. He just came from coach of the Colts, but he'd been with the Raiders. So he knew the NFL pretty well. He did a great job. He drafted some younger guys, but he did a good job of drafting some older veterans who had NFL experience. We had a really good team. You play in the World League. And then did you try to get back to the NFL? Because I know a couple of years later you played in the CFL. I went to camp with the Bills. They just came off that Super Bowl loss to the Giants when they missed the field goal at the end. So they had a lot of good players, Jim Kelly, Thurman Thomas, James Lofton. I went to camp with them. I didn't make the team. 100% different from the Eagles, the way they ran camp. It was fun. It was a completely different offense. I was used to running there wide open, throwing the ball. And so I enjoyed that. And I thought I had a good camp. Actually, I led the team in receiving during camp, but ended up not making the team. So I went back to the World League for the second year. We didn't have as good a team. A number of our players you know, didn't come back. We lost John Horton, who was probably our best receiver. We lost Roy Hart, who was probably our, one of our best defensive players. We didn't have as good a year. I think we were like three and seven. After the second year with London, you went to Seattle and then Dallas. Seattle for training camp, but didn't make the team. Then the Cowboys signed me right after the 92 season. So I went through their entire offseason program. It was a little bit hard for me. You play a whole World League season, then you have about 
three or four weeks to get ready for an NFL training camp. Felt like I needed a, a good off season to build myself up to go to an NFL camp. So I was able to have a good off season with the Cowboys and had a good training camp and, and I ended up making it on the practice squad for the Cowboys in 93. Compared to like a modern day practice squad where they have, I think it's, I think it's 16 guys now that are a lot on a practice squad. What was the practice squad then like, and what was your role as a practice squad member? Then I think the, the roster was at 49 and then they had five practice squad guys. So I was one of the five. I was mainly the running back. Scout teams run on the, say, the Philadelphia Eagles offense or the Cardinals offense. I was the running back who ran those plays. So in essence, you were Herschel Walker one week or Roger Craig the next week. Well, yeah, you tried to be that. After the 93 season with Dallas, you went to Canada, although not really to Canada. When the CFL expanded into the U.S., what was your experience like trying to play three down football i enjoyed it it was a fun league to play in it was wide open threw the ball lots 65 to 70 percent of the time you were able to catch passes i played running back there's more space it was fun i thought i had a good good year and it was a fun league to play in at that point where did you see your career and was there any thought of maybe i need to look at either getting into coaching or doing something else? I ended up playing the CFL that year, 94, 95. I played in San Antonio for part of that year in the CFL. I was able to play in the last game at Baltimore Memorial Stadium. That, that was a good thing because that's where uh, we had the, one of the playoff games when I was with San Antonio in 95. But then after that, you know, it was time to sort of figure out what I was going to do. Before we let Judd go, Judd, I want to talk to you a little bit about your book that you wrote a few years ago called No Wind. I was reading a little bit about it online and was looking to find out a little bit more, like kind of the background that went into it, kind of tell the, the listener a little bit more what it's about. They say everybody's first book is sort of autobiographical. It's a fiction novel set on the Jersey Shore and it's about kids growing up, going to the beach, playing baseball, going to Catholic grade school, then going to a private school for high school and just their experiences. And it's sort of a coming of age story. But I, I try to make it more than that. I try to address some important issues that, that kids face in their lives. It's an interesting book. There's a lot of baseball in there. So if you're a baseball fan, there's a, there's a lot of good baseball scenes uh, that, that you'll appreciate. But there's a lot of other stuff going on, so you don't have to be a baseball person to enjoy the book either. It's it's a good coming-of-age story that I think a lot of people can relate to. As someone who's written a book myself, mine was an autobiography. I can kind of relate to that. Did you enjoy writing the book? Was it kind of maybe, I would say, perhaps a little bit cathartic just to kind of write it to get your feelings on paper? Definitely cathartic. It's a good way of expressing yourself. It's a little bit of a, as you know, a difficult process. Writing is easy for me. The editing process is really hard for me. So I can get a lot of words on page, editing it into what I want or to what I consider good. That's the hard part. The cathartic nature of it is great because I'm able to get a lot of things out there. But getting it into a story that's relatable to people that's a little bit of a, of a difficult process for me. I can certainly speak to the editing part where to yourself, it feels like this is right. But then when you kind of take a step back, you say, eh, maybe this isn't the cell I thought it was. That's the thing I like to do is, you know, I'll write something, think that it's good, let it sit for a while, and then go back to it with fresh eyes. What's good and what's bad jumps out when you're able to go back and look at it if you let a few weeks or a month go by before the last time you touched it. That's a little bit of my process. It really helps me. Sometimes what you think is the most relatable turns out not to be in something that you think, ah, maybe not, but I'll put it in, ends up resonating more than you could have ever thought. No question. Absolutely. The people that have read my book, who I've talked to about it, you know, it's just interesting 
how they will say, I really love this part. And I'm kind of like, really? <laughs> or this character really spoke to me. And I'm sort of looking at them like, those were not the parts of the characters that I thought were the most interesting. But I'm glad that some people do. That's a sign of something good if people are able to take things from it that they enjoy, even though it may not be what was intended. Judd, thank you for joining us on I Played 2. And we'll hear from Judd again when training camp start, where he's going to talk about his coaching career and prospects and how one might evaluate a prospect. So, Judd, thank you very much, and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it.